more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment. What's going on everybody? Thought I'd do a little story time for you of the time that I was hooked on cigarettes from a very young age and till the time that I quit for real for reals and still have. I haven't been addicted to cigarettes for almost 10 years now, I guess. Doesn't mean that I haven't had tobacco since, but I haven't been addicted. You know, society's had a flip-flop relationship with cigarettes throughout the course of history, and there was a time, man, when doctors would prescribe camel cigarettes. Bloody good for you, mate. Smoke three a day and you'll get your erection and be able to please your woman. I have no idea if they said that. I'm just making, making stuff up. Hey, buddy. You guys have met my cat Felix, right? I don't really show him on the channel too often, but... I love this little fella. <laughs> He's like, ah, get off me. Uh, yeah, so anyway, so we'll go back to the, when I was... Oh man, it's, it's a little bit embarrassing to even admit that I was smoking cigarettes when I was 12 years old, but... It's what happened, I'm not gonna lie about it. So, 12 years old, I go into high school for the first time. My first year, I don't know anyone. I'm trying to make friends, be cool. I've kind of been like that rebel type of personality where I like to go against the grain and I don't know, do crazy shit. And for whatever reason, I remember seeing these smokers. Like they were like the cool bad boys of our year level. And they'd walk out the toilets smelling of smoke and people would be like, ooh. But for whatever reason, there's something alluring about being that bad boy type and doing illegal things that you shouldn't be doing. And so I saw this, and I'm like, yes! I walked up to the guy, I'm like, hey man, let's plan a cigarette smoking session tomorrow. <laughs> I can even steal some smokes off my mother. Yes, I stole cigarettes from my own mom. And I remember she was smoking like the weakest cigarettes, I think it was like one milligram. So I would have to like, either cut the cigarette butt, till there's only like this much length, Anyways, I steal a couple cigarettes. Next day, we meet in the toilet. Right by the urinal. Such a awesome set and setting, eh? And I lied and I'm like nervous as man. And especially if we get busted. Like, oh, that's a real big deal. And I light it up. I don't inhale, I do the And then one guy who was with us, he's like, yeah, when you when you Inhale, go, and then I went. <laughs> Coughed my lungs out. I was like, "Holy crap!" I've got a crazy head spin. It's almost like a mild psychedelic trip, I suppose. And for most rational people, they would have that experience and be like, "Why would I do this to myself? This is horrible for my health. I'm spending extra money. It doesn't even feel good." But. There was something about the culture, I suppose, that I just got attracted to and being a part of the crew. And so, I continued. And I became a cigarette smoker for a very, very long time, throughout all of high school, every single day. And that would be like our mission, to save up money. I remember cigarettes were 50 cents Australian for one, which is, man, that changed even two years from then. They rose up to a dollar. Now, holy crap, man. You could buy a packet of 20 and it'd cost you 30, 35 dollars, so... I... I wouldn't even know how much cigarettes would be sold in high school. My guess would be at least 2, 3 dollars each. In a way, it was fun. Like, you know, I can look back on it now with hindsight, you know, and just easily be like, Oh, that was just stupid, I shouldn't have done that, whatever. And for the most part, that's true. But there was like a, this adventure, this exciting, chaotic realm right, where we'd be on the edge of order and chaos and sometimes we'd get caught, get in big trouble with our parents and all of that and sometimes you just get that rush, that adrenaline rush and that nicotine hit and over time that, you know, went into smoking weed and drinking alcohol but that's not what this video is about, it's about cigarettes and so it's interesting because I think I remember watching a video, it was actually a, a government ad campaign against cigarettes and they basically said that it takes, I don't remember the exact number, let's say 50 to 100 cigarettes to get addicted. So cigarettes isn't that type of drug that you have once and then you're just hooked. Nah man, it's like you have to force yourself 
to even get to the point where you're addicted. And over time I did. I mean, if you're gonna smoke cigarettes every single day for years, eventually you're gonna get hooked. And then when you try to quit, you're like, oh shit, now this is just a part of my habitual pattern. And it's interesting because I don't think like, yes, nicotine and tobacco is addictive, but I don't think that's the reason why people struggle quitting. It's more breaking out of habitual patterns, which is the same with anything. You know what I mean? Like I could easily, even within my own life, I could easily recognize that video games have been, if anything, more addictive than tobacco, because at least tobacco, it's, it's gross, people judge you for it, it's expensive. There's a lot of cons with it, but with video games, that's way more, <laughs> way more alluring and much easier to get hooked on depending on your personality. But again, don't want to make this about video games. But also, I did want to emphasize the fact that when you're addicted to a substance, and on some level you can look at it, yes, yeah, there's a chemical composition, it hooks onto your neurochemistry, and then your, your physiology becomes dependent on it. And that's all true to a certain degree, but it's really about your self-image. What do you want out of life? Your desire and the habits that you put yourself into that is like a much stronger factor on whether or not you're gonna get hooked on something. And we'll go into it at the end of the video, but I s smoked for, yeah, about 10 years throughout all of high school and there would be times where I would quit. It wouldn't last for too long. Maybe I'd go a month without quitting, but then I'd just go back to hanging out with people who would smoke cigarettes. And I was very weak-willed in that if I was around someone who was smoking cigarettes, and I'm trying to quit, I just can't be around you. I had a really big problem with saying no. And a lot of this, which will go into the end, was self-esteem issues. I've always been young and fit and athletic and on the top of my class when it comes to fitness and even academia and all, all these kind of things. I was doing very well. And so even though I was smoking for years, I didn't quite have that motivational push to stop because it's like, I mean, yeah, I'm spending money. Yeah, you can make a list of cons of how quitting is going to be beneficial to my life, but a lot of these things haven't been, didn't set in reality. And I was just too deep into that phase of my life. But eventually, reality catches up, and I started to feel early signs of emphysema. And there was a good period, I'd say at least a year of my life, where I couldn't take a satisfying deep breath. Like, right now I could go, <sighs> and that feels good, amazing. But on my later years of smoking, I went, and I couldn't quite get there. It's like I could only breathe in 80% of the way and there would always be that extra bit that, it was like torturing actually, because I could never get that satisfying breath. And it started to set in and kind of freaked me out and that's when my motivation for quitting became much stronger. And over time, I tried many things, substitutions, if I was in school today smoking, I would have probably quit tobacco and just switched to vaping. You know what I mean? But that wouldn't have fixed the root of my problem. And I know that now. And back then, I'll get, when I went through cycles of quitting, I'll just replace it with another habit. Even with weed, because we used to mix it all the time. Then after I quit for a while, we just switched to pure green, right? Because without tobacco, and, you know, I used to think that weed was healthy and a medicine and all that kind of stuff. And so when I would substitute it with something else, and because I didn't really deal with the root of my addiction issue, which was self-esteem actually, then I'll, eventually I'd fall back into it. All, all I needed was one situation where, you know, like for example, I could go two months without smoking cigarettes, everything is fine, I'll maybe switch it to with video games or some other dopamine hit. But then when I would be in a situation where I'd be in a party or catching up with old friends and we're drinking beers and alcohol and then smoking cigarettes, well, of course I'd be like, and people are always offering and hear the, well at least where I grew up, the peer pressure was so strong that if you're not drinking with other people, you're a weirdo. There's something wrong with you. Like, what's the point of you even being here? It's actually rude not to drink. <laughs> and almost with smoke, well, smoking not as much, but with old friends who used to smoke with you forever, they try to bring you back. And so I would. I'd succumb to peer pressure and then all, all, all it would take is one cigarette and boom, I'd go right back. Which again proves that 
doesn't matter how long I went without smoking, the fact that it only took me one cigarette to fall right back into that habitual cycle, clearly something was wrong. And so we fast track 10 years later from, or almost 10 years later, because that was actually one of the turning points, not just the emphysema and the health issues and all that kind of stuff, but it was the, and so part of that was like, holy shit, I, I, gotta, I really, really have to stop. And like I said before, I've tried many times, I'd go through cycles, maybe five, six, seven times, right? The span of 10 years of me quitting and being successful for a short period, but then falling right back. And then with tobacco, I tried to justify in my mind, oh, you know what? I'm gonna stop smoking cigarettes and move to rolling tobacco. I mean, there's a lot of positives to that. Number one, there's less chemicals. That's a bonus. Number two, the cigarettes are much smaller, so you're not having such a big amount every time, and you can kind of make it as big or as small as you want. Plus, you have to go through the effort of rolling, because when you've got a pack of cigarettes, as soon as you feel like one, it's just boom, bam, bada bim, bada boom. But then with rolling tobacco, you've got to go through this whole process, and you know, I wasn't as skilled of a roller as I am today. Like now, I could just boom. It'll be almost as quick as pulling out a cigarette. <laughs> from a packet, but back then it was, it was a struggle, you know, I had to learn the, the craftsmanship of rolling, you know, because even with weed, we were smoking bongs back in the day, not jo joints, joints came later, I don't think I've smoked a bong in, uh, I don't even, I can't even remember, too, too many years to count, and so I swapped to tobacco, well, rolling tobacco for a little while, and it was definitely better, for sure, but I think that humans can use this justification of, because I'm substituting this harmful drug with a still harmful drug but not as bad we kind of pat ourselves on the back and again it's better to substitute it with something less dangerous than not do anything about it at all but you also need an end game eventually i quit not being able to take a deep breath sucks breath is a source of life even theologically they believe same with humans man if you don't breathe you die that is the source of life when you're constantly smoking cigarettes and these harmful chemicals and constantly filling up your lungs with tar and that has a cascading effect on all aspects of your life your mental health your physical strength your fitness your cardiovascular system and all sorts of other things i'm sure if i kept going <laughs> i would have had a lot more health problems we have enough struggles on a daily basis going through this life so to add the trouble of breathing man that i, I can't emphasize how destructive that was, but it was also a spark of motivation. I guess I needed a glimpse of hell to scare me back into heaven, right? So the difference mindset-wise of when I quit this time and why it stayed for so long, again, this happened, I quit almost 10 years ago, and I haven't struggled with cigarette addiction since. And I'll go into my relationship with tobacco now, but when I first quit, I guess the difference in mindset was, well, number one, I was genuinely more concerned with my life like, you can have all these pictures on cigarette. These motherfuckers. <laughs> all this construction going on in Australia. Let me move this into the other room, just in case it gets. Oh, wait, wait. They stopped. So, like I was saying, you can have all these scary pictures and fear tactics on cigarette packets. And it does work. Like, it's better to do that than nothing at all. Because clearly, cigarette smoking has gone down. At one stage, it was like a fashionable, cool thing to do. Now, you actually get judged for it. Like, I remember it's, I had a, a tobacco at a, at a wedding once, and they're like, dude, no one smokes anymore. Huh, there you go. You can have as scary of pictures as you want and have dead babies and gangrene foot, but when someone doesn't want to stop smoking, that's not going to stop them. It's just a kind of inconvenience, like you kind of just, it's like white noise at that point. Oh yeah, there's another baby's foot. Oh yeah, there's more gangrene. Oh yeah, that's Steve-O who fucking died a horrible death. Oh well. Oh, this is medicine. <laughs> and so we can logically understand the negative consequences of certain substances, but sometimes if you have a stubborn mind like I did, I needed reality to show me like, hey man, this ain't going good. And my, again, my fitness was going down. This is after high school as well. And I quit, but this time around, instead of removing myself from 
anything to do with smoking environments like I did in the past. The success on you overcoming your addiction depends on my surroundings. So like as long as I'm in a, a nice cushy environment, there's no one peer pressuring me, there's no cigarettes, there's no temptations, then yeah, of course, it's easy to quit in that way, but that's not how the real world works. So mindset wise, what I did is, you know what? I'm not gonna have that same bullshit excuse of, let me smoke this last cigarette packet or this last tobacco pouch before I quit. No, I still had like, you know, maybe my pouch was about 80% full. I had heaps left. And I tell you what I did? I didn't throw it out. I left it on my desk, right there in front of me to tempt me. And what I did was practice my willpower. And so every morning when I saw that tobacco pouch, whether I was craving it or not, I just practiced saying no. No, 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 not today. No, 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 right? It's like building your willpower, lifting weights so your muscles can break down and grow further. And then when the temptations got too overwhelming, I'd go for a run. Because when you smoke for that long, you're incredibly unfit, at least compared to what you used to. Because yeah, I mean, compared to the average person, even at my 10 years after smoking cigarettes, I was way fitter than the vast majority of people, but this is a very dangerous trap to fall into when you compare your life to other people. It's like, yeah, but my life is better than this guy and you know, he smokes or I smoke or whatever. That's, that's bullshit excuses. That's gonna send you down a very dark road. If you're gonna compare yourself to anyone, compare yourself to who you were or who you could be. And I knew that my baseline for fitness and health was down here. And because I've experienced it high before, so I'm regressing. And so when I get this intense rush and just wanting to smoke that cigarette, because I'm feeling down and weak and vulnerable in that moment, I'd go for a sprint. Not just a run or a walk or a jog, it's gotta be intense. It's gotta overtake your physiology. Like you run to the point where you're panting. <laughs> And you know, even when you're a cigarette smoker and you do the hardest workout of your life and you're, you're struggling to breathe, sure, you can smoke your cigarette afterwards, but in that very moment, a cigarette is the last thing that you want. So I put myself in that situation where even when I was smoking, I didn't want to smoke. And so I was panting, I'm tired, I'm <gasps> trying to catch my breath. And then that helped. And so the temptation or that overwhelming feeling of me wanting to smoke went down and down and down and while I'm talking to a cigarette pouch going, no, no, no. <laughs> and even when I was, I think I was studying a course at this time and every time there was a lunch break, the smokers would go outside and I would go with the smokers. Again, usually I'd be like, no, nah, I don't want anything to do with tobacco. If I just see one, I'm going to crumble. Again, it's not a very sustainable way. Sometimes we have to do that, at least in the short term, especially with harder substances. But with tobacco, it's a bit different because it's accepted in society. It's one of the, the two main drugs, along with alcohol, that is completely okay. But for whatever reason, tobacco gets a much worse rap than alcohol. Just look at the commercials that you see. Look at a tobacco commercial. <laughs> fucking gangrene foot dying, your heart fucking growing black tar everywhere and then you look in that an alcohol ad and it's like hot girls and like yeah and successful men having fun you know so it's I don't know maybe one day we're gonna look back on our tobacco uh, uh, sorry our alcohol commercials as we did our tobacco commercials so because I realized that I can't escape this at least avoiding tobacco altogether I'm like you know I'm gonna have to face this and build my willpower and every time some uh, smokers would go out I'd go with them and over time your physiology changes. Like you think that you want cigarettes, but then as soon as you purge it out of your system, the smell of cigarettes is actually disgusting. I understand why people hate the smell of smoke. Because it is gross. Well, especially, and again, when, when we're talking about tobacco, we're talking about our Western industrialized version of what it turned into. We put so much more unnecessary chemicals and all this kind of stuff. And so like, I'm actually not against tobacco at all, but definitely against its current form in the form of cigarettes. And then here in Australia, I think we have one of the highest tax brackets for cigarettes. There was a lot of layers to it. I'm just sharing like a couple tips 
because uh, I don't want to make this video too long. But fundamentally, it's mindset. Mindset is everything. That's why it's, you've heard the quote before, I'm sure, that says, those who believe that they can, can. Those that believe that they can't, can't. And your self-esteem is basically your self-image, right? And your self-image is directly correlated with how big you're thinking. So if you're struggling with tobacco and you're just addicted and you just accept that this is part of your life or maybe your goal is like, oh, I don't want to quit, I just want to cut down. Instead of smoking a packet a day, I smoke half a pack a day. That's the thing about thinking. Whatever your goal is, deep down you feel like, yes, I can achieve this, then that's what you're going to achieve. And then you won't get any further. So it all starts with the quality of your thoughts and your mindset and the vision that you have. Mine was, I'm quitting forever. That's it. Because when I went through, I learned a lot from every cycle that I tried to quit and failed and went back. But I remember during those times where I really struggled to quit and then would be in a party or any social situation, someone would ask, do you smoke? And I would respond with, uh, I used to, but I quit. I used to, but I quit. That's a direct reflection of my mindset. Because if you're not a smoker, you say no. Doesn't matter if you smoke for 15 years and you just want to show, maybe it's like a pride thing. Like, yeah, I quit. I used to smoke for this long, but I've quit now. No, just say no. No, I don't smoke, move on. These little patterns that come up within your own language and how you speak and the way you frame it. If you've quit weed, and someone asks you like, oh, do you smoke? And you'd be like, oh, I'm going on a tolerance break. Oh, I'm doing this. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But if you want to truly quit, you have to have conviction. Even if you don't believe it, you've got to just say it until you will yourself to. When you get addicted to anything, you, a big fundamental problem is that we, get, we identify ourselves with this substance. And then the more you smoke or take a pill or drink, it starts to become a part of your physiology and then that warps your mind to think a certain way. And so at the beginning, that's why addiction can be so challenging for many people because they have to basically restructure who they think they are. It's not as simple as, oh, it's just a chemical reaction and well, then therefore you just have to take a drug and that will free your neurochemistry from this drug and then that's it. Again, in very extreme situations that could help, but to have that as the final solution just never lasts long term. Oh, hey buddy. Look at this fella. God, I love this kitty. So even though in certain situations, like with the really hardcore substances like heroin or meth, then in that case, I wouldn't say, yeah, hang out with the, all the junkies. <laughs> and you can practice your willpower and say that because you're so much deeper in your shit, in certain situations, you have to be extreme and be like, nah, I'm cutting all you motherfuckers out of my life. I have to move on. I've got to change my environment. Because sometimes even a plant, doesn't matter how strong of a will it has and how much nutrients you feed it, if it doesn't have the proper soil or even enough space in its pot so its roots can grow, it's always going to grow at a suboptimal rate. But at the same time, we have to take things step at a time and it starts here. It doesn't mean that it ends in the mind and if you want to move and change environment and all that kind of stuff, that's cool, but not everyone is in a situation where they can just do that and pack up and leave tomorrow. And even if you do that, if you don't deal with your fundamental problem with addiction, it's going to come back and it's going to test you in other ways, right? And that's even considering the fact that I've smoked tobacco since. I think the first time I smoked tobacco, I think I went... I went at least, let's just, I don't know, I'm just kind of guessing, let's just say four years I went without smoking a single cigarette, not even one drag. So four years later, I drank ayahuasca for the first time in the Amazon and, you know, they have the whole culture about mapacho, which is the American cigarette, uh, sorry, the Amazon tobacco, which is called nicotina rustica, whereas the tobacco that the majority of the Western world smokes is Virginia, so it's a different species. Still tobacco nonetheless, and actually what's even crazier is because, you know, usually nicotine gets framed as being this bad guy, and yet the tobacco that I smoked, even after being an addict for so long, had way higher amounts of nicotine, and I still didn't get addicted. In fact, I struggled with it. I did it for like 
spiritual purposes, but maybe we can make a video dedicated specifically to the cultural background of mapache and all that. But I would smoke it for a certain reason, right? In a certain spiritual context. And when I do, it's something that I do on a whim or to let loose in a certain situation, but I don't allow that to become a part of who I am. One tip that I wanted to share though, and that is, like, yes, I was practicing my willpower, no, 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 <laughs> no means no. One of the best ad campaigns I saw, the anti-smoking campaigns was never quit quitting. That means that when you quit, and most times you'll eventually fail and fall back on the wagon, that doesn't mean, ah, oh, there's no point, I'm never gonna really get through this. No, try again. And the next time you quit, you'll go for a bit longer. Or might even go for a bit shorter, but you will learn something new each time. You fall back on the wagon, try again. Don't quit quitting. It gets easier every single time. And so one of the important things that I learned of my past quitting cycles is that the time that I'd fall back on the wagon or off the wagon, I forgot what it is, there's a Seinfeld episode about it. Every time I would fall was because I drank alcohol. And then that would open up the floodgates and then I just couldn't, I just couldn't help myself, you know, because just having a beer or a glass of whiskey with a cigarette was like, oh, it was heaven on earth. And so when I quit tobacco for reals was when I said to myself, I'm not going to drink alcohol for three months. I gave myself three months because I knew that if I can go that long with that smoking cigarette, it's no longer a physiological addiction. And that's just mental if I, if I choose to go back to it. And so I didn't drink for the first three months at all. And because I purged the nicotine out of my system, a few months later when I did drink, hey, guess what? I don't feel like smoking cigarettes anymore when that would, would be my Achilles heel. That would send me right back to where I started. But I didn't, and like I said, I, you know, I have tobacco every once in a while, but it's like how an old man sort of smokes a pipe while reading a book every once in a while or has a cigar at a wedding or something like that. And now I can enjoy it for what it is. And because I've gone so long without it, and you know, I can breathe and I can, you know, I'm fit and I'm healthy. I've got a healthy mindset. And so tobacco is no longer an issue at all. So I don't recommend smoking tobacco years later to test if you're over it or not. That's Again, I think that's using pride and ego, whereas in my situation, it just came naturally. And because I was confident in myself and my self-image that it wasn't, wasn't a problem. It's actually easy peasy, easy peasy. Other addictions, sure, <laughs> have been a lot more, more difficult over time, but you can use these principles and apply it to whatever addiction that you're, you're facing. And of course, it's, varies in degree on how hardcore a substance is, how deep into it you are, and what's your economic status, and where you are in the world, and what opportunities you have, and your self-image and all that. But again, I just wanna say that it all starts with your mindset, how you view yourself, and especially your goals. If you have small, pissy-ass goals, then that's as far as you're gonna go. If you have big goals with conviction, and then you match that with action and discipline, it's actually very surprising to me how easy it becomes over time. And so if you're personally struggling with tobacco, you can try the tips that I shared. Addiction can be a complex subject, but it also doesn't have to be. If you just go to the foundation. If you, if you look for the cure of addiction in physiology and the way that chemicals interact with your neurochemistry, then I don't think that that is a very good long-term solution. I mean, it can help, but if you don't have the mindset and the self-image and the clear vision of who you want to be and where you want to go and then start to act that way until it becomes reality and then you remove all the parts that you thought were yourself but really weren't. And I'm sure you people in the comments, you people, <laughs> but you know, I'm sure that you guys in the comments section have had many of these experiences and I'm sure there are many inspirational stories of people quitting like real hardcore stuff Sure, it can come in cycles and some people will say to themselves like you can never really overcome an addiction or you can it's a lifelong battle and again it's all mindset. If you believe it's gonna be a lifelong battle, guess what? It's gonna be a lifelong battle. That's just the truth of the matter. And so while it's not useful to have wishful, naive thinking and unrealistic goals, you still gotta have some sort of an ideal. You don't want 
realistic to be down here. You want it to be at a achievable level. Even my mother quit after smoking for 40 years. 40 years? And she actually quit because I, was, I kept stealing her cigarettes. <laughs> so she did it for me. But that would have never happened if she didn't have that, that vision. You know, obviously she valued my life more than hers and you know, it worked for her. She hasn't smoked a single cigarette since. Every impulse and craving can be fulfilled in some other way, a more effective way that's gonna be good for your growth. You know, that's a whole separate video, but I'm gonna leave it at that. Hope you guys got something out of this. Thought I'd share my cigarette story. I realized that I never really shared it in depth or at least made a dedicated video. If you're just as addicted as you are to vaporizers as you are to, as you were to tobacco, then again, you're still just substituting one problem for another. And just like tobacco, which we thought wasn't that bad, we thought actually it was healthy, it was good for you. I'm sure that further down the line, we're gonna find out some really messed up shit with vaping. And who knows, it could be even worse in some way. Easier on the lungs, but that lungs is only one aspect. So yeah, I'm not here to scare you guys of vaporizers. And even this one that I've been smoking the last two days, I'm like, nah, I'm done. Again, I'd have no interest for it. Like, I'll do it just because it was, it was kind of there, and I I think I like the sugar taste, because it's like, it's sweet, you know? So it's never the tobacco or the nicotine that I'm interested in anymore, even though I was so hooked that I was, man, I was, I was a cigarette dealer at school. I was really incredibly hooked in a very hardcore way, and started smoking when I was 12. So imagine my undeveloped brain, and how much more hooked I got in that habit, and how now I'm looking back on it like, I made it hard on myself, man. That, that was really the crux of it. I made it difficult for myself unnecessarily. Change your self-image if you're struggling with addiction. Watch the language that you're using and try to work towards that discipline and will until it's, not, it's no longer difficult. Even if it's difficult at the beginning, over time, if you keep going, I promise you, it's not that hard. Because once you change your identity to I'm this person now, you no longer have to go upstream. You're actually going downstream, because that's who you are now. You know what I mean? I hope I made sense. Anyways, hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoy our work and want to support us, then go check out patreon.com slash yourmatetom. We do exclusive live streams over there and some exclusive content. And like I said, it really helps out the channel and will it all goes towards like future, like high production videos. Not necessarily this one per se, you know, more like with the documentary, but also this, so I can do both. Because I know a lot of you guys like these talking head type of videos. And I think at one stage I was going too far into, I only have to create high production documentaries and I was getting too much in my head about it. Whereas I noticed now it's, a, it's good to have a balance of the two. Like now I'm focusing more on just the talking head videos to develop my speaking skills and to be connected with you guys more often. But trust me, in June when we have our turkey retreat, that's gonna set up a whole new cycle of the documentary filmmaking, but I'll also keep up with this kind of video. So let us know if you have any questions or topics you want me to expand on or any stories you wish me to share. All right guys, all the best, much love. Peace.